welcome to the Under a Police podcast. My name is Daniel Bader. This week on the show, we're talking Pixel 9 Pro Fold with uh, our, our regular co-host, Will Saddleberg. How are you? I'm good. I was ready to introduce myself, and then you stepped on me. I'm sorry. I had a my, I had a special my, guest to introduce that I wanted to get. I wanted to roll over you. To yes, get I'm the non-special guest, and then of course we have a special guest. The truly the special guest. Our I only our only listener is now our only guest. <laughs> so I don't know who's gonna hear this, but uh, Michael Fisher, welcome back to the show. <laughs> uh, thank you. I make it a, a, a policy of not listening to episodes on which I've guessed it, so I, I don't know. I, I can't answer your question, but uh, someone out there will enjoy it. That one, yeah. that one person who reviews pod, tech podcasts on Twitter. I, I know, I know who guy, you're talking that about. Guy Hopefully sucks, they like by it. The way. <laughs> no. Right. Well, he's gonna now, give this now, a bad now, review now. We're down now. To zero. now we're down to no listener. Since, uh, I mean, this is an aside, but Pocket Casts allows you to review and or rate yes. podcasts now, and uh, that's all well and good, but you can't actually leave a review. You can just leave a rating right. on a podcast, and I don't think that's good enough. I think we need an actual alternative to Apple Podcasts for leaving yeah. ratings on podcasts, because I feel like it's just easy to game the system with a rating, whereas... With a proper review, like you can, you get some context. And uh, yeah, Apple. Nobody reviews Android podcasts on Apple Podcasts. It's just like a, it's just not a thing. Yeah. So we gotta, we gotta make this happen. Anyway, that's a. I'm, that's... I'm sorry. I agree with you, Daniel. I'm, I'm having difficulty focusing because one of my cats has, has just used used the litter box and, and is is celebrating by destroying the apartment. So. Uh, any <laughs> any sounds of loud crashes or, or growls uh, behind me, please ignore. I am safe for the moment. It sounds like a big cat. He's, he's got a lynx in your apartment. Yeah, yeah, he's a long boy for sure. All right, well, we're gonna we're gonna talk primarily about the Pixel Nine Pro Fold this week. The embargo lifted today as we're recording. June, June. My God, it's definitely not June, June. anymore, that folks. That would be awesome. <laughs> it would be. Uh, the summer is over. My kid went to school today. It's been a very emotional day. So I'm living in denial. But uh, the embargo lifted today, 1 p.m. East, September 3rd. So both of you have your thoughts. Michael, by the time we, this is published, you may have a video, you may not. Both of you have the phone. Uh, you've had the phone for five or six days. Not enough time. Not enough time, which is why there are very few reviews out right yeah, now. Yeah, I feel like this is the most, uh, just like looking around, because it's only been an hour since the embargo lifted. And like looking around, I was like, oh, like, truly no one published a review this we all just like silently I'm, agreed that this I'm was so not enough time to hear yeah. that because i was going to advocate i was never actually going to do this but but at the risk of getting into inside baseball too early i um i was going to try and round up some people to be like hey um are you guys also kind of annoyed at the fact that google is the one and only company that sets embargoes consistently immediately following a weekend and in this case yeah. following a holiday weekend a long weekend yeah I'm not. I'm just not going to do it. Like even if I had gotten the device on time, which I didn't, I got it more than a day late. Um, I just, you know, I'm too old for this, and and I don't think that that it's enough time, as to your point, will to like actually yeah. for me anyway to deliver a solid recommendation or not. So I'm I'm happy to even wait. a day late, like like the earliest that as far as I know people got these phones was last Wednesday, and it is Tuesday. So like it's just you know yeah. it's hard enough when it's like a small upgrade compared to like last year's phone but like this is like a total reinvention of the phone we spent like an hour and a half talking about a year ago and it's a lot uh there's a lot to process about this that i think i don't know i i i we had already kind of talked about not doing this like after a uh a holiday weekend and the fact that it showed up on like wednesday afternoon for me was like definitely locked it of like there's no way i can have a full review of this ready to go for tuesday it's yeah. just not happening. Which is why it's great that embargoes are, are embargoes and not deadlines. I think that's yeah, a, true. often a confusion about that. It's like it's yeah. a it's a competitive deadline if you are if you find yourself in, in need of, of, of competing with other publications who are, who are going to go at, at lift. But Yeah. Okay, so we can't say definitively this is a buy or, or a not buy yet. I think it's too early. We'll probably end up talking about it next week. But what I wanted to do today was to unpack the the product as insofar as, as you've kind of spent some time with it, come to early conclusions, feelings about it, and then go a bit wider 
later on in the show and just talk about the foldable as a an ostensible replacement for the the traditional smartphone form factor what it's sort of settled into i think michael you are one of the most vocal advocates of the form factor mm -hmm. and i want to hear because i'm sure you hear about it far more than we do from people advocating for or against it right you you being a spokesperson of a particular thing you get an inundation of opinion right mm -hmm. so for sure that's how i'd like to sort of structure the show a little bit let's talk first just about the product so we talked a little bit at the event michael but give us your first impressions of this as you saw it back at the made by google events and since and since then like how has that evolved if at all right your initial impression was was x has that changed since you since you received it or has it been yeah. fairly consistent that's actually a really good question because when i saw it and it, I, I think this was almost a universal opinion shared across all of us like there was so much evolution compared to the first generation that that's almost all i could focus on i was like oh my god look at how many things they changed let's try and take apart why they made those changes and whether or not i i like them and since in the in the intervening time like since that disparity focus has sort of evaporated, I've found myself no less satisfied with the end product, but 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 much less able to become excited by it um, mm -hmm. in, in in a way that is not typical of of a lot of foldables because a lot of foldables still excite me. You know, I think whether or not you agree with Google's decision to to go with this much more common form factor that better resembles a OnePlus or a Samsung, it kind of completes the plateauification of foldable design that we've been seeing like the 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 fun quirky passport style surface duo oppo thing is is no more i think that's a little bit sad that category that lived between flip phones and and books type foldables is just i don't know if anyone will build another one in there and i think that's 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 a little bit frustrating because that first gen pixel fold you know for all its compromises was quite a special thing in comparison and the, the new Pixel, while it's superior in every ob objective way, feels less special. And um, I don't know, you know, I've lost touch with whether or not that will matter at all to, to normal people, but that's how I feel about it at the moment. Novelty is obviously an important part of any new form factor. But as the form factor has matured, and particularly the way that companies have started to differentiate themselves in their implementation of what we consider foldable software where does google where do google's decisions end up for you because i i'm getting the feeling based on that initial salvo is that you feel like samsung or oneplus or even some of the chinese brands that overstuff their software with features that's ideally what you want out of a foldable because it's pure potential. You have more screen real estate. Again, like, correct me if I'm putting words in your mouth, but that's the impression I get is that Google's more restrained take on Android, its minimal take on Android, is actually doing it a disservice when it comes to creating a foldable software experience, particularly when the phone is open. I think that's a good point to make, but it is not a point that I would make. Um, I, I tend to like a little bit of, of sensible restraint when the boundaries of utility have been reached. And I think we've found what the what those boundaries are. I think um, unless you're a financial analyst or something like Samsung's implementation of multitasking where you can run four apps at once and then a fifth over the top of all of them, it's just like kind of absurd. And certainly cramming in a bunch of AI features uh, as, as Samsung has done recently, uh, you know, doesn't really add a lot of value that's specific to foldables either. So I, I actually know I don't have a problem with Google's, you know, implementation of its of its Pixel software, which is excellent on on this foldable. I don't know that there needs to be much more innovation than we've seen, with the possible exception of, you know, maybe OnePlus's implementation of, of multitasking, like that, that kind of open canvas thing. I'd like to see more of that in general. But I can't fault Google for not for not just throwing in some stuff that they will have to support for years that very few people will will utilize. You know, I think I've always maintained that a book type foldable, when you open it up, this like there's a thought trap, there's a mm -hmm. there's a, a gully to be th that that a lot of people fall into. It's like, but so many apps aren't optimized for it. And I'm like, true, 
And then when I look at my usage, I'm like, well, what am I doing? I'm in the browser. I'm in Chrome. I'm in YouTube. I'm in docs or I'm multitasking between threads and Instagram and rotting my brain. Like the, the, I don't need many more apps to be optimized, you know, for, for this form factor because the bulk of the time I spend in apps is, is well serviced by an eight inch screen, which by the way is, is dope as hell. I mean, I just, I love how big the screen is. Okay. If you're, so just because we didn't mention at the beginning, this is the first show that we've recorded and we'll put on YouTube and cut for, for social. So that's why Michael is in such a good mood because he just loves being on video podcasts, (laughs) but, uh, (laughs) the very height of the medium. We did want, (laughs) we did, we did want to have a special guest on to kind of be the launch pad of our video. A podcast because uh, apparently that's what you got to do to to win to win these days on on, on the social media networks. <laughs> so anyway, let's let let me just stay with that track for a second, Michael. So what is it about this that is not exciting to you? Then is it a matter of is it this product or is it the fact that this represents sort of that? plateauification, as you said, of the foldable form factor. Yeah, it's not the product. It's what it represents, because I think the product is very good. There are very few objective complaints I have about about the execution. It is what it says about the category as a whole. It's like that phase that these five years, this roller coaster ride, has has, has settled into an end. We've, we've reached a logical like end point of, of design, at least for the time being, of flips and folds. And any time that happens, and you've been doing this for as long as we have, I think that that that's a little sad. Okay. Will, let's yeah. take let, let's get your first impressions. I'll ask you the same thing, right? Has the have your thoughts of the phone changed since the first time you saw it a few weeks ago to now you've had it in hand a few days? Do you think that evolution will impact kind of your final thoughts on the product? Um, no. I mean, so so to me, like my first uh my first impressions were that they had fixed a lot of my complaints around the original Pixel Fold, which I, which was a phone I did not like very much, if at all, to be honest. And like every time I've gone back and revisited it, I've been like, no, I still don't particularly like this. And they did so. I mean, I mean, like not to echo too much of Michael, but like they did, they did it by like making it essentially a OnePlus Open, which I wrote about months ago at this point. Whenever the first like real leak of this phone happened, and I was like. It's kind of a bummer that like Google is already throwing in the towel and being like, this is just how foldable should be. They should just be like a normal smartphone on the outside and then a bigger screen on the inside. And there's no room for creativity in that. And it makes it really useful, right? Like there has never been a moment using this phone over the last week or so where I've been like, like, uh, th- like the keyboard is uh, uncomfortable to type on, on the, on the front screen or whatever, right? Like, I think it it makes it more usable to like someone who is buying this, but I do think that it makes it less exciting, especially because it's like it's not even like this is like the first time we've seen this form factor. It is very OnePlus open. It is like if you added a little more left side bezel to the OnePlus open, which is how it goes from a 7.8 inch screen to an 8 inch screen on the inside. That's like otherwise it's like kind of it's thinner, which is nice, but like. It's it's so similar to that phone that I've used that that is the foldable I have used the most over the last year right since since the open came out that it is it is kind of interesting to go from like that software experience to like this more pared down one where you have to be a little bit more I don't know like it does just become I'm in Docs I'm in the internet browser I'm in YouTube when you're using the the inner display with like a few different uh you know a few different ways to like customize that but even then like you were so limited to just two apps side by side that like i'm glad they added app pairs but it does become one of those things where it's like the software experience to me like does feel a little bit limited and i'll have something live on the website later today as we record this about it but like i do feel restricted by the fact that i have to like only have these two apps they can only be side by side they they can't kind of extend off the side of the screen the way open canvas does and like you have to i don't know 
I can throw two apps if I want to, like, next to each other that don't make any sense, but then, like, I'm really just using the one app and then just keeping something open next to it because I have that screen space. It doesn't make a lot of sense. Yeah. I have a question about yeah. that. Like, in some way, was the first generation Pixel Fold a little bit more exciting, or not more exciting, but, but at least maybe more useful as, a, as an on-ramp into the world of foldables because you didn't always want to do things on this on this wide cover display. Like it was, it's reachable, it had a lot of good things to it, but it was kind of weird. So you found yourself opening up more often in the same way you do with the Galaxy Fold because it's too tall and narrow. Right, right. So you found more excuses to get inside the thing and use that main display and therefore unlock a lot of its capabilities. Whereas Google did such a good job on 9 Pro Fold making this basically a Pixel 9, the cover screen, that yeah. like, I, I feel like I don't, I open this maybe 30% less I often than I do yeah. other ones. And then I'm sitting there being like, well, why did I even, why do I even yeah. have this? It's weird. It, it, yeah. And I'm the last person to say that. I'm, I've never, ever said like, give me a normal phone. But this feels like using a normal phone. And then you have to like remind yourself there's a tablet inside here, which is great. I don't mean to characterize that as like a, a great feature that I'm saying is a, is a, is a negative. Yeah. That's not what I mean, but. It's just a shift, right? It's a change. Yeah. It it does make me kind of become that person who's like, okay, now I wish there were more apps optimized for the screen, though. And part of the problem is that this is like almost a one by one screen. So like some apps, like Pocket Cast, honestly, like are a little janky. And like if you open the like now playing section and and Pocket Cast thinks you're in landscape mode, stuff like that, right? Where it's like it 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 is a little weird with the aspect ratio, and so. And games especially are, like, the thing where I was, like, I, I could really, like, I, there have been a couple of, I've been wanting to play the mobile port of Dragon Quest V. Let me buy that, even though it's $15, because it's a Square Enix game, uh, and see how that runs on the on the inner display. It, it doesn't, really. Like, it's too, it's, it's locked to, like, a you need a smartphone display for it. So, like, hmm. the only thing you can do is push it off to the side or whatever. Otherwise, there are, like, controls that you just can't touch. Like, the scaling's all off it's the same like i don't even play a lot of games but like just the couple that i've tried it's it's i do find it frustrating to run into these roadblocks with a with a device that the whole point is you have this big screen in your pocket and then it's like oh but not that though you can't and, do that and while i don't have that problem as often or as severely as you i will i will say that that's another reason that i'm sad google abandoned mm -hmm. the ultra wide pixel fold right. one because and I was, I think I was the only person making this point, so I, I don't know, that, and I have nothing to back it up factually, but like, it seemed like an implicit urging by Google to developers to be like, hey, widescreens are important, please make Android tablet apps. And I, you know, I don't think that really happened again. It did not. No, I'm, I'm with you. Like, even down to like, the thing I want to do the most with this is have like a, a relatively normal smartphone on the front and then open it up and have a really good way to watch videos on a plane or something. And like, this is okay for that. It is a bigger display than what you could get on a normal smartphone. But like, because we moved to the OnePlus Open style of like, it's basically a square. It is a little wider if you turn it on its side, but not by that much. Like, you end up with this experience where you always feel a little bit like, Okay, but like if I had just like an actual tablet, this would be a much larger screen, right? Which is something that the original Pixel Fold managed a little bit better just by opening landscape by default. It wasn't perfect, but like I, it was better for yeah. video. I agree that 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 is true when you're treating it like a tablet. But your your yeah. example of an airplane is perfect because like what you actually want to do is is do the the tabletop thing and have yeah. it stand itself up. Like I genuinely feel real sympathy for all the normals out there who I see like balancing their iPhone on a coffee cup to watch something or take a photo. I'm like, you nerds, you need a hinge. That's what you need. And we have a hinge, Will. Rejoice in the hinge. There, it's okay. We do have a hinge. You can also buy like a $15 back of seat plane uh, holder that, that is cheaper than a foldable, but we do have a hinge. That is true. Okay, yeah, I, I want to I I wanna just... I can't abide that. I want to I wanna interrupt for a second. First, I... I, I get this phone tomorrow. It's on a UPS truck somewhere in Toronto. I'm very sad about that. I couldn't share in this uh, in this moment with you both. But but I think as somebody who's used most other foldables, I've done enough kind of total immersion into the form factor now that I feel confident saying compromise is inherent, right, in it. Uh, there's a 63%... Uh, it's it's it, there's a 
you know, 60 plus percent increase in cost between the Pixel 9 Pro Fold and the Pixel 9 Pro XL, right? It's just, it's a, it's an expensive phone. You, you're supposed to feel like you're getting something for that increase, right? You're supposed to feel like the value inherent in buying a, an expensive foldable. And Michael, you talked about this with Rick, right? Why haven't foldables dropped in price since they launched five years ago? And, you know, his non-answer was, was pretty, was pretty frustrating because basically yeah. all he said was, we're putting the best technology in here. Costs are going up. There's no way that we can drop the costs of these products without sacrificing some sort of the functionality. But I, I disagree with that, obviously. I think there's there's easily a way to do it. But I think inherent in the form factor is compromise, right? The the aspect ratio is probably the biggest. The 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 thickness of the the total package is the other one. Right? Mm -hmm. And you know, starting with the aspect ratio, Google had the choice when it made the Pixel Fold last year to force developers in a subsequent version of Android to yeah. adhere to a better landscape experience. And they, they just didn't, right? Google has never put its foot down when it comes to Android development the way that, that Apple has. And as a result, we are left a year later kind of with this sunken feeling of realizing that developers are not going to create bespoke experiences for a very small population, right? So yeah. Google, instead of forcing their hand or making it so that Android will better adapt to the landscape experience, has gone the other way under Rick and said, okay, well, if we can't force the developers, at least we're going to give our users the best vertical app experience. But that, again, does not account for the awkward near square for the aspect ratio of the big screen, right? And you're saying you use the inner display 30% less, but that's still, you still are going to open this device and, and not always know what's, what it's good for, right? What is the inner display good for, if not for all the things that Will said, right? Gaming, media, so all I, of the I above. Had a I had a conversation, I had a back and forth over text for genuinely like 35 minutes uh, with between myself and, and Ben Schoen at 9 to 5, like essentially arguing this entire conversation on Friday, I think, or Thursday. I don't remember when we had it. And I basically, like, I, I agree. I came down to the point that, like, these are always going to be, like, niche products because the best use cases you're going to find the best things you experience that you're like oh okay this is when foldables click for me is always going to be they're going to be niche examples that fit to you specifically so like the best thing i've done with this phone so far and this is true is sunday night i had my fantasy football draft and i had that going on the right side of the screen and i had a bunch of notes and cheat sheets on the left side of the screen and according to Yahoo Fantasy, I my draft was an A plus, and I'm I'm the favorite to win this year, which I've never had before. So <laughs> I think I owe that to Google, I guess, and foldables as a product category. But I'm not about to tell people to run out and buy this because they can make money in their fantasy football drafts, uh, or or pools, I should say. Uh, and like I think they're always gonna be like that, where it's like I really enjoyed using it this way, you know, putting aside the fact that like like the obvious of like video or web browsing, like putting those aside, I think basically everything else is going to be kind of niche specific use cases like that with a foldable. And I don't like until Apple comes around and does do the thing you're talking about, Daniel, which is if and when they make a foldable, they will put their foot down and be like, you have to support this aspect ratio and 90 whatever percent of developers will like big developers will do it right. Like Instagram will still, not i guess but like everyone else although they, they do have a foldable ui so maybe i'm being unfair but like yeah, i, I, I think Instagram they will do right. that and and it's it will be frustrating from an android perspective to be like why is google not just putting their foot down and like i mean i guess they can't i guess is the answer i mean they absolutely can arguing with my well yeah go ahead. they can't and they should, but I, but I also think. But, but I'm thinking now. I'm thinking about it from the legal for four perspective. Four years now. I mean, right? Android like... 12L 
existed for well, this form factor. And then they were like, actually, we're kidding. Android 13 is for this form factor. And then they're like, we no, actually, it. we're joking. Android 14 is the real one where developers are going to start investing. And then they're like, actually, uh, we're just not going to mention foldables in Android 15. And, and I think that has been sort of the through line for all non-traditional form factors across Android forever, right? Everything Michael has ever loved. I don't know. What what happened to you as a child, Michael, that made you love all the things that Google just decides to neglect? I really want to <laughs> psychoanalyze you here for a moment. Uh, if you got the time, yeah, let's see. You, I'm I'm very that. expensive. That's that's the that's the problem. <laughs> but I do I do take Canadian dollars, so it might might work out in your favor. But I do like it's it's interesting, right? Like we we started here having the same conversations about. Android tablets back in 2011 with the with it Honeycomb. Feels very Android tablet. Android Wear when it debuted in 2015, same conversation, right? We've had since 2019, hoping, praying that Google would put its foot down when it comes to uh, adherence, uh, but it feels like that is just going to take. It's going to be one developer at a time caring about this thing, and then it's going to take one person as you said will buying the foldable having that one moment where it's like oh i get it right like mm -hmm. i i went to i have an i had a not with a with a book foldable but i we had my daughter's birthday party uh this past weekend and i brought my motor my motor razor plus and i was like i have an idea i'm gonna do a time lapse of this why like they were it was like an art studio so I put it up in the corner of the room. I framed the time lapse with the preview cam. And I just, it was like the best. And, and I showed yes, it to yeah. everybody afterwards. And I was like, this is a thing that you can only do on a foldable. And right. it was incredible. And it was like, not only was the, was the functionality super intuitive and easy to use, but the result was far better than any time lapse I could have taken with a, a regular phone because I could adjust it as the party went on without disrupting it. And I've had a few of those experiences over the years, but I'm no foldable stand the way that you are, Michael. And I wonder, what were those experiences for you that kind of got you to this point where you daily drive a flip or a book foldable? Yeah. So the the flip is a, is a totally different conversation just because like it's, it's, it's the use cases, the implementation, everything is different about it. You opened this episode though with a with a by evoking the old pro moniker for for a lot of phones right where it's like are these you know these were meant to be the new pro phones and are they and i really think they are because the things like a, a month after i got the galaxy fold in 2020 i ended up in, in a hospital bed really unexpectedly for like four days and i had the fold with me so i did not miss the ipad i couldn't pick up the kindle i couldn't pick up on the way to the hospital I, the fold did it all and i was like oh wow and then when I started traveling on on aircraft all the time, as I still do, um, people would be walking down the aisle way and would stop and be like, "Oh my God, what is that?" I'm like, yeah, this is my phone, but it's also a tablet. So like, this is the only thing I need for eight hours across the Atlantic or whatever. And it does go back to this thing. I really think that the focus on apps is a good conversation to have from a Google strategy perspective, from an Android historical perspective. Yes, but when you're a real user and you have a Kindle in your pocket that now fits in your pocket without being a huge brick. When you can open a PDF attachment in an email that looks like dog shit, I don't even know if I can curse, it looks like nonsense on, on, a, on, a, on an iPhone or a, or a Pixel 9 because it's a portrait screen. Wow, you can see that for real. Like you can browse real websites, go to the desktop view. You like Evernote, you know, it's multiple columns and like doing stuff and video calls, you side by side, shot list and email. It's like spreadsheets, God bless them. We hate spreadsheets in this in this house, but you know, um, they look great on a big old square screen. Like there are so many ways having a giant screen in your pocket is beneficial that I feel like the only reason the category continues to be at like one point five percent adoption rate is that this thing is eighteen hundred dollars yeah. five years later. If it weren't, if it were thirteen hundred dollars, we wouldn't be having this conversation. The whole tone would be different. Yeah, I mean I I, I think part of the problem is is 
and this flies right in the face of what you just said about not having to grab devices out the door headed to the hospital or whatever but like mm -hmm. i think part of the problem is that right now you can go buy a pixel 9 pro which i think is a pretty great phone and you can buy uh, just the ipad like the 10th gen ipad or whatever and that net, you're at that 1300 1350 dollar price that you just said make sure right? that you have a messenger bag with you make sure that i mean you i mean yes but like but like, like is I mean, it you don't is it you worth carry it all the time yes it's worth it absolutely 100 percent. condensing normal those products into users one, yes to normal people it's worth yes. 500 dollars. that's Over that's where i think it comes in a year yes i it's like i there's no way I, I, I will never people... be deconverted about this like it, I'm yes, not trying to. I don't even is, disagree is with you. Crazy in a in this portable in this tiny package, hundred percent. I don't disagree with you, but but I'm thinking of it from like I just know that is how normal people think of it. Is is is. It, to be honest, they're not thinking about having to go out and spend thirteen hundred dollars right now. They're thinking about the fact that they bought an iPad three years ago, and so they already have that thing. They need a new phone. Why why are they spending? eighteen hundred dollars so that they can have a tablet i already have a tablet it's fine whatever uh, increasingly hypothetical normal person is also going into a carrier store and paying nothing they're paying something over the course of two years for this and they're going to trade sure. it in after a year for something else like i mean sure i don't know i cannot speak to normal people i don't sure. think that we do we probably shouldn't so like i just i take your point i agree that they're too too damn expensive still i wish i had gotten a better answer out of rick but like that's the the factor that is the thing holding it holding it back like i think that and 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 messaging because no one has ever managed to succinctly communicate this very simple idea of like big screen goes in pocket comes out of pocket big screen or small screen yeah. you choose okay yeah I, th I think the fact that we are still having the conversation about the tablet form factor and the the usefulness of the tablet form factor a decade 15 years long after uh that debuted is why so few people have purchased book foldables and yeah, i, I wonder there. if there's just something to be said for this dilution of purpose and and people wanting to just admit that like it's much harder to work on a big screen tablet or phone than the companies that make the phones and the software that run on the phones want you to believe. So I agree with you, Michael. Every time I use a foldable and I used an open for a couple of months and I loved it, but I also didn't love it in many ways. And I thought it was a bit chunky and a bit heavy and not the experience that I ideally want out of a smartphone. Plus, I have kids, blah, blah, blah. Like, this is another thing, too, that we don't really talk about around foldables. The fact that it is IPX8 is is great yeah. now, but it's not IP68, and it's certainly not easy to put a, a case on it and just, like, take for granted that it's, it's going to be unharmed when your kid throws it across the room. Uh, but that's a separate conversation. But I also think the ability to read a book, wonderful. The ability to have a two column book inside kindle without having to turn the thing 90 degrees why is that still a thing in 2024 right like all of these and i i, I think that's what that's i keep coming fixed on this now by the way sorry to interrupt you but that was one of the things i was oh my god say. really yeah i take everything i, I said <laughs> but i i also just think like the thing that we talk about will and i have talked about this countless times on this show Android software quality still pales in many respects to iOS software quality. And then you add that unknown factor of how an app will work on a tablet inside a foldable. Yeah. That's what I hate when I talk about a, this to a normal person. It's like, I think you should get this because the hardware is incredible. Yeah. But I also don't want somebody sinking $1,800 to have an experience where they're going, why is my app working? this way because it right. didn't work this way on my phone when i had that or why is the experience between the front display and the inner display so different and what right. can i do to fix it and then you dive down these rabbit holes and i i think that's what i keep getting hung up on is and it's why i love the pixel 9 pro so much because the experience of android has never been better 
I hate to do this, but like I we're coming at this diametrically opposed because like I'm like, yeah, OK, if I open Pocket Cast and it's a weird layout on the, on the cover, I'm like, well, how oh, crap, what can I do now? I didn't bring a candy bar like, oh, wait, now I have one on the cover. Like you run that app outside. Like, would it be great to have those things consistent? Yes, it would. But that is just like that is inherent to the Android ecosystem, right? You so we've the... had to design for yeah. uh, many, many different screen types over the over the over the years. So it's like. I, does the utility of having both screen types counteract that occasional inconvenience and inconsistency? And I think it would for a lot more people, again, if the price were, were low. Do you know what it is? It's love having both of these screens, and I want to just be able to use them whenever I want without having to think about which one I'm using in which app. That's what it is. It's just like, I want to just be like, oh, I already had the phone open. I can go, like, play Pocket Cast or whatever without being like, oh, this looks bad. Versus like, oh, like I'm going to like, I'm going to use Pocket Cast. Let me close the phone because it, I know it runs better on the cover screen. I, yeah. I think it really just comes down to like, I don't want to think about what I was just doing. I want to do the next thing I'm going to do on my phone without having to be like, this doesn't look good or this would look better on the front screen or vice versa. What's so funny is like, let's, like if you were to run this episode, uh, the audio of this episode and just stack it on top of like, a discussion of the Galaxy Note 2 in 2012. I know, no, no, no I know. How many things would we be saying? Like, I, it, like it's, it's, unchanged. it's the age-old thing of like, yes. Android, do more, but kind of jank. iPhone, nice, clean, do less. Oh, like, I disagree. I disagree. Because back in 2012, when we talked about the full, the, the, the Galaxy Note, Note 2, yeah. Android did nothing well. It was all jank. It was all <laughs> cognitive load, cognitive <laughs> overload and DIY, right? It was, if you want Android to work for you, you had to work for Android. Now I'm at the point where I don't think about Android any differently than iOS because it just works well, right? I can, I can quibble about the fact that like the day one app is not as pretty on Android as it is on iOS or the fact that like my favorite library app, Libby, gets updated on iOS every week and hasn't been updated on Android since April. I can quibble about that, but the functionality, the core functionality of both of those apps is good and they're stable and they work. Even apps like my kid's daycare app, where I definitely did not think that it would be on par because all these small developers do not give a shit about Android. And yet yeah. today I can maybe count on three hands, three hands, three fingers or, or three hands, you know, whatever. The number Borrow of hand. apps that That's have fine. major quality differences. The one thing that I will say is like, and this is a, a tiny, tiny thing, but like Hades did not come out mm -hmm. for Android when it came out for iOS uh, through the Netflix game store. Yeah. And like, that's a tiny little exception to the rule. Nah, I, I, I don't know. I think that's a, diff that's a different episode because I have had that very different experience. Like I, every time I hang out with my iPhone wielding friends and they're like, yeah, did you use Flighty to track that? Did you notice that gate change? I'm like, oh, I don't have that on Android. Or like, oh yeah, I used this app to make a reservation. I'm like, oh yeah, Resi doesn't make an Android app. Like that gulf is increasing and it's getting worse. And it's one of the one of the bad things. I, I think that that parity is diminishing, which is why every time people are like, do you think Apple's going to make a foldable? I say, I freaking I hope so, because it'll solve the one of the issues you just called out, which is developer disinterest and making these these kind of dynamic apps at least it won't be the such an alien lift mm -hmm. it won't be such a like oh, i gotta do it for google and then i'm gonna sell 10 copies of this app but like, i don't know i think it'll demystify it it'll de i don't know i think indie developers it. are still very very much focused on ios paid apps by indie developers that's yeah. still very much owned by the other side but if you are a company creating an app that's supposed to be cross-platform, Android is part of your pipeline, right? It has to be. Or you make a decent web app that will work on Android that is not like a huge, it's not a, like Claude, for instance. When Claude by Anthropic, right, that Android app launched a few months later, but it had a really good web app that worked on Android since day one. As they keep iterating on the Android version, the web app is still kind of at parity it's not a not a perfect experience, but like I don't use a single app that I can point to, and I guess maybe that's because I don't really seek out kind of the 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 latest startup 
apps anymore. Like I don't, I don't really, I find a way to make it work on both platforms because I go between them so often. Yeah. But you're right. I mean, obviously indie developers still care more about iOS, but I mean, Re Resi is one of the apps I was just talking about, which is owned by American Express. They are not a, a, a little startup, you know. They intentionally torpedoed their Android app when they were acquired. So, yeah, but cut again, American I think it's Express some slack, Michael. You're right. I think I know. that's they the least yeah, you could do fair point. for one of the biggest financial institutions in the country. I mean, the, the, the Venn diagram between Amex owners and iPhone owners is basically 100%. So. Which is another big issue. Yeah, right, 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 right. Yeah, we've, 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 we've made this into an, an Apple versus Android podcast. But no, I don't mean to. I just think it's it's instructive to look at it because the tablet experience on a foldable is like the extreme end of that user experience, right? right. And I don't think it's a bad idea to, to see it from that perspective because while I think it, it kind of it flows back to that initial conversation I wanted to have, right? This is a phone first. It's Google's best idea of a foldable, and therefore it's Google's one of Google's best phones ever because clearly the Pixel 9 series is so good in so many ways. No question. Mm -hmm. However, when Google builds limitations into its own products by virtue of the software that even if it's siloed and firewalled etc cetera, etc cetera, that it makes you know that other companies like samsung and oneplus are having to sort of go it alone in many respects and the whole idea of google coming out with this platonic ideal foldable design is that developers are going to take notice because for better or worse pixels are still references right so mm -hmm. where does that leave us in terms of an overall user experience so let, let's let's like bring this back as a product that one can buy this week what are your kind of takeaways from it i'll start with you will like is this a phone how's the camera how's the how's the experience of using it versus other foldables that you've tried it's about as good as the open I mean, like it's it's so weird because like the one plus flavor of android specifically on the open is so different from what google is trying to do here but like Th this is essentially what I think we wanted from the original Pixel Fold, but like in a in a better piece of hardware that does not overheat, that does not um, have a really poor quality inner dis. Oh, hi, Jules, welcome back. I don't know. You're back though. It's okay. it's okay. I don't know. Also, by the way, Jules has been like annotating. Oh, I know. I saw them like halfway through all the notes. I missed all of Jules. Eighties nuts is the notes. best single line i've ever read so thank you for that i don't remember what i was saying i'll get it we'll get there it doesn't yeah it doesn't have any of the like it's not like a really poor uh quality display but either of them but like specifically the the like main inner display is like really nice um i don't like i will be curious to know what michael thinks of the camera because i have not taken a ton of photos yet but like I have not been super impressed outside of like well lit uh, shots with the primary lens, but like the second it's either like darker or like I'm using the five X lens, which it like does not want to swap to a lot of the time. I have like of the five X shot, it's it's uh, it's not like the Pixel Nine Pro where pretty much every time I took a telephoto shot, it was using the telephoto lens properly. Like it it will you'll look back and be like. It was just like digital zoom on the on the primary lens. Um, oh, that's I don't know. That's it's not weird. A, it's not a bad camera. It, I mean, I just assume that it's deciding that it's it needs the extra yeah, exposure. The, the sensor is um, so small that yeah. it needs it like thinks that the primary sensor will give you a better shot. Exactly. I don't think it's a bad camera, but I'm like I'm not blown away in the way that like I feel like every third shot I took with the nine pro, which isn't even like a, that different of a camera from last year's, but like that's just how long it's been since I've just used a, a, a pixel flagship because this year's been crazy that like every third shot I was like, oh, man, this is a good shot. Look, look at me taking good photos. And then like with this one, I'm back to being like, that's an okay shot. There are some issues with it and some things I don't like. I was trying to take, um, Maddie and I had a bonfire last night and I like took a photo. I took, 
I was only going to take one photo of it, and then I took a bunch of photos of it trying to get a good photo of it, and I couldn't. Yeah. It yeah. was really, really struggling with, with like the balance between the light of the fire and the darkness around it. It did not. It did not know what to do with it. But I mean, otherwise, I don't know. Like, I I enjoy using it. I'm like, I don't know if I'll stick with it because I do love the nine pro so much and i think it's like such a good sized device and it's uh significantly lighter uh but like basically every complaint that like michael and i last year on this podcast like shot back and forth with each other either agreeing or disagreeing on certain things like they have addressed it and it is such a phenomenally better phone in my opinion that i like I would have a hard time telling a Pixel Fold owner to not upgrade because I think it's like it is the three or four generation gap that you would be looking for for an upgrade. Like it, this is not a Samsung story of like, great news, guys, we got rid of the gap. We'll see you next year for another iterative upgrade. Like it, it is a massive leap from being like, in my opinion, in last place in the foldable race to a front runner. Um, and I think Samsung has become the also ran in this case, but, but yeah, I, I like this phone quite a bit. Michael, what do you, uh, what do you think of the other aspects like the camera speakers, battery life, et cetera? So I think uh, the camera is, is the most complicated one to discuss. I've actually been looking at all the shots I've taken over the past four days or whatever with this. And like, it's so hard because from a strategy perspective, I think I'm, I'm, I'm disappointed that Google has pivoted to this kind of like this era of AI toys. And that's how we're going to define our camera now. You can add yourself to a group yeah. shot and you Agreed. can change the sky color and do all this kind of stuff and, you know, make make this building out of pencils. You know, OK, sure. Here you go. But like in the wake of that and kill and democracy is, in the process. Right. Well, there's that. Yeah. <laughs> but like. It, it, this is not helped by the fact that I've just come from reviewing the Xiaomi Mix Flip and the the the, the relevant part of that is that that has a Leica branded camera assembly right. and Leica offered a lot of film emulation and stuff like that. And yeah. like, so I went from this camera with so much personality, like it or not, you know, call it a gimmick. Sure. Whatever. It, it's a fun gimmick, but you, you could take photos and you really like could convey something with the way you took that photo to come to, to the pixel, which is like, has always been great at so much stuff, but it, it mostly has rested on its success in like HDR and kind of shutter speed. And it, it, I was talking to Hayato Kusman the other day about this, and he reminded me that uh, sterile is a good word to describe the output from the Pixel's camera. And I think that, like, I have to Snapseed these to death to, like, make them say anything in terms, you know, tonally. And sure. maybe that's because I'm not as good a photographer, but, like, I just wish that, y y you know, I think Google lost something when, when it stopped focusing on, like, what, what impressionistic painters are we trying to emulate with this color science and move to, like, how many, you know, it's like images of Barney the dinosaur on fire. Can we put next to the Empire State Building? It's like, uh, you know, four. Nine. the answer yeah. is four. Okay, okay sorry, well, it depends on off. which screen you're viewing them on. To be honest, that's, right. that's why <laughs> another reason you want that big inner screen. And I, while I'm complaining, I will say I think it's just, I think it's 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 insane to charge eighteen hundred dollars and and not put your best cameras on this thing. And they're their whole yeah. excuse is, yeah, well, look, we needed to make it thin. And, you know, foldables and physical constraints. I'm like, yeah, I do. I also know that you guys put a big old camera module on there anyway. So it was possible. You just didn't do it. Um, and I think they've relied on a lot on the processing to make up for those hardware deficiencies. And from what I've seen, they, they don't. They don't really do it. It's better than last year's for sure. But then, again, you have to lean on the AI stuff. It's like, well, use Zoom Enhance. Well, I have. It doesn't really... It tries to make up a face on someone that doesn't yeah, really it's not good. exist. It's like, so that's 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 a bit of a bummer. That said, I've taken wonderful photos with this. It has one of the best zooms on a foldable, which is great. So a lot of them compromise on that. We have true five X optical zoom. Um, I pushed it into twenty and got usable, yeah. great, great stuff. So you know, and given enough light, but that's always the that's always the thing. So like. And also, because it's versatile, it's not like a flip phone, Daniel, where you can do a time lapse like you were saying. I think to get to true foldable insanity, what you got to do is put a big camera bump on there so you mm -hmm. get the, the proper optics. But then you also got to add a screen to the back. So I think there's a, there's a way to make these even more absurd. But you can still pose it on a tabletop, take the shots you need, 
get shots, time lapses, the things you otherwise wouldn't be able to get uh, without a dumb accessory. I love so, that that's the Michael Fisher end game for foldables. It's like add a third screen on the back. Absolutely. Absolutely. How can you make me happy? Well, try this. Uh, it didn't work. Uh, try some more. Uh, to your point, uh, Michael, I, as much as I did enjoy the photos that I took with the um, with the Pixel 9 Pro specifically, but like, you're right. That phone, and I had this thought while I was reviewing it, that phone is like allergic to contrast. Yeah. It, it wants It wants everything to be so bright. And I'm like, and and to be honest, this is like Google's whole thing in general, because that's also my problem with Video Boost is every time they demo Video Boost, they're like, don't worry, guys, all those shadows, look how much brighter they are. And I'm like, but it looked, it kind of looked better before. <laughs> it kind of looked right. Yeah. I, I think I've told this before, but like when they first demoed Video Boost at the Pixel 8 announcement, Taylor Kearns and I were sitting next to each other and we like both shot up and like looked at each other to be like that looks worse right like we both had the thought of like like that definitely doesn't look it was like a right. nighttime shot in like tokyo or something yep and it was like all of the character in the video was like gone and i was like doesn't look good guys everyone pay attention you see all the the digital noise that's hidden by the contrast and the in the in the raw shot what if we increase the brightness by 500 yeah. percent? yeah that's what yeah. they're kind of still doing and it's a bummer because we know Google possesses the imagination necessary to do things. Um, I had such a good time with long exposure this on, yeah. the, on the fold. It's not a new feature. It's several years old at this point. But like car motion streaks, boat motion streaks, like putting my face in the middle of a frame and having it be the only thing not moving, like cool artsy stuff. And that was from an era where we were still deciding that you would capture an image and manipulate it but but using stuff that's already there rather than just yeah. dropping stuff onto the image wholesale that never existed. So bummer, um, but but overall, you know, a, a, a very good camera for a photo. I think probably, I want to say that I, it's not the best because I feel like OnePlus still brings character I and I also think chops. OnePlus, yeah, yeah, I fully agree with you that like if you told me I have to pick one, I think I'd be like, I, I've had more moments from the open where I'm like, I just like the color processing more. Like, I just 100%. think this turned out better. Yep. All right. Yeah. So we're too early on battery life. I think we're too early on sort of final thoughts. But what I want to get... Although it's been solid, I will say. Like, I've, I haven't had any battery issues. Okay. I've been, I've I mean, been a well, down, but I, I, I assume battery down? is okay. fine because it's still a big enough cell that... And, like, I have no issues with the Pixel 9 Pro, which has a smaller battery. I guess my question is, this is coming out a couple months after the Fold 6. This is coming out, what, eight months, nine months after the OnePlus Open. We've heard sort of rumors that OnePlus is going to release a new Open next year. I think the OnePlus Open 2 could be sort of the the the, the kingmaker, I guess, of this, uh, of, of this uh, category. But, you know, who knows? Obviously, Xiaomi just came out with a, a, a book-style foldable, so did Honor. Neither of those will come to North America, but a lot of cool hardware stuff in there. Where is this phone in relation to what exists right now, Michael, versus uh, what maybe you were hoping for? Like, is this the best foldable you can buy in North America? Is it the best foldable you can buy in the world? How are you thinking about it in, in relation to everything else? Should you just buy a OnePlus Open right now on sale? Uh, no, it's so it's it, it it's it's rather difficult to to encapsulate that at this juncture. I think I need a couple more days, but I will say that I I tend to recommend the Samsung product to most people who are interested. So that's a small subset as we were talking about. But people who are interested, yeah, I've been thinking about getting one of those. Which one should I get? It's like because Samsung is on generation six. You have all of these enhancements that are very boring to talk about, and but which taken in the aggregate make it, you know, a pretty rock solid product. And if it fails, I, you know, with a Samsung product, you still have more options than anyone else to repair it. Mm. And Samsung has more warranty experience, and Google has not managed to shed its terrible customer service reputation. And then for all the things the OnePlus gets right, you know, you still have this dumb thing where even on this new one, this red one they released a couple of weeks ago. If you go from a humid room to a cold room, you oh, get yeah. condensation under the camera lenses. And it's like, uh, sorry, dudes, that's that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that may well go away the minute the phone heats up. But that is a that is an indictment of a lack of attention to detail that after a year that I'm like, um, I'll carry it. 
because I'm out, I like the Hasselblad stuff and I'm a phone nerd, but will I recommend it to, to most folks, given that there's a Samsung alternative and most folks don't care about the 5X Hasselblad? So I think Fold 6 is going to be, is my go-to for most people still. Hmm. But the Pixel really, it's between the Pixel and the Fold 6 and the, I, I just, I just need a little more time figuring out the, 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 the total package of the Pixel. But I mean, they're, they're very close. But I think post sale support matters a lot for eighteen hundred bucks, and you gotta you gotta have your act together there. And I'm just yeah. not convinced Google does. Well, what are your thoughts? I mean, you keep saying the OnePlus Open is kind of the best foldable you can buy for like the, the best value book foldable you can buy. It's certainly the best value because you can get it for for that basically for that thirteen hundred dollar price that we were just talking about. Like right. it's not hard to get it for that. And and even a year old, I still think that the the Snapdragon H N two is a good chip. I think that the displays on that are good. I think it's it is bulkier than this phone, but it's not too bulky. Like it's it's not you know it's not where we were a couple of years ago when it was mostly, if not entirely, just Samsung in North America. And like I I wrote about this today, but like the Galaxy Z Fold four was it's not that old. And like you hold that phone today, and it feels like a fossil. Um, I know I held it today, and it felt like a fossil. Yeah, I don't know. I. Uh, agree with michael that like it is it is i do find it like kind of difficult to recommend one plus yeah i i had not i i i knew about that fog issue and i knew that it was still appearing on on these red ones and it's it is a i agree uh, a a lack of attention to detail um although like i know people love to hate and including you uh daniel i believe love to hate on that big camera module and i maintain that i still kind of like it because it gives my finger a place to balance when i'm holding the phone but regardless um I yeah i agree it just looks like shit it might but like i don't i'm not looking at the back which, of the phone i'm sorry which one looks like shit daniel <laughs> come on I, you think the oneplus open looks worse than the pixel oh i think better the pixel sorry looks, yeah i do yes i do i think that's absolutely a, not i love I think that I agree with camera them. module on the pixel i think it looks you ele- love the camera I love module? It. i think it looks elegant love. i think it looks minimal i really? adore it <laughs> are you am i drunk <laughs> No, I just have good taste. Oh well, so that is something I've never strong. had. Like, I love it strong. Like, I don't know, man. <laughs> I think it's. I think it's awesome. Honestly, I think they did a really good. Awesome. Job with it. I will continue using adjectives, effusive adjectives. <laughs> I write for I'm a living. Keep I could keep repeating going. them in exasperated tones. Thanks. That um... sounds great. Okay, <laughs> that I I I think that's all we're gonna talk about with this. I'm gonna end uh, with with a, a new segment that I, I would oh, like God. to debut on this week's show. It's a it's a thing that I did when I hosted the Android Central podcast back many years ago, and I think, Michael, you probably remember this. Uh, it's got a different name, but it's the same idea. I like to end the show thinking about something happy, something that we like. I, I stole this from NPR's uh, excellent podcast, Pop Culture Happy Hour, What's Making Us Happy, uh, but I'm going to call it this time tell us something good because everything needs a good branding but basically the idea is i want you to tell me something that you enjoyed doing watching reading listening to or just like something that made you happy over the last week well i already know your answer because you talked about it before the show but please Did tell I? Us. I don't think i have a i have not talked about what my answer would be what oh okay good then I'm, I'm 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 looking forward to being surprised okay you'll go first then what is what is uh What's well, something no, good what that happened this week? What do you think my week? answer was? Lost season four know. that you told us you right. Over the I weekend. did so. So Michael, I did tease in the in the um podcast channel in our Slack that I had rewatched the end of Lost season four. Yeah. Uh, purely because uh, when Daniel put this invitation in Google Calendar, he labeled it something like uh, with absolutely <laughs> no Lost talk, and I I just love <laughs> to taunt right. him, love to taunt the person who is responsible for my employment. Yes, uh, guys, as you I should. saw. I saw Twisters. Me too. Sam. In. Yes. Okay, I didn't see that. No, I didn't. I saw Twisters in 40X, which we have, Daniel and I have talked about before, because I saw Avatar The Way of Water in 40X, and I know on that episode we talked about it. X, for people who have not been, is one of the theaters with the moving chairs. They splash water in your face. Uh, Uh, They give you the wind and everything. They Oh, Twisters in 40X went viral in the week it was in theaters before it was pulled for Deadpool because it was a crazy experience and they re-released it and I got tickets to a sold out show and it was a blast. That that movie's so fun in 40X. It is like an amusement park ride for 2 hours. It's it's insane. It's so it makes the movie genu- genuinely better because I had seen it already. 
And then I saw it again in 40X. And it's great. It rules. Uh, if you can do it, do it. They should re-release it once a year in 40X. They'll make so much money. I've, I've never down. heard of a better movie, like a, a movie better suited for that treatment it, than Twisters. Truly, yeah. like yep. I, I kind of dragged Maddie to it, who had previously had absolutely no interest in 40X. <laughs> and <laughs> like the, I was like, okay, so like the first, because she had not seen the movie. I was like, so the first scene, they're definitely going to like tease. Like, I, I think that will probably give you a good idea of what to expect from 40X. Just give me like a thumbs up at the end of it. If you're good to stay or if you feel like you can't handle it, we'll bail. It's not a big deal. And like at the end of that 10 minute like opening scene, which is like spoiler for the opening of Twisters, like a scene with multiple characters dying. Uh, she was laughing like a maniac and like thumbs up. This is great having a great time just throughout the entire thing every time a twister hit in that movie it's like here we go again because it just throws you around it's great what a blast that's my that's my thing for this week michael i wish i knew if we had any 40x theaters in new york city i would actually i would almost go see it again just for that experience so thank you for the for the interesting idea mine is as different from that as it could possibly be i have, am watching not a new thing not with four dimensions uh, but an old thing I have fallen into rewatching the 1989 sitcom Doogie Howser, M.D., mm. <laughs> Incredible. <laughs> which is currently streaming on Disney+. Plus. Uh, I was delighted to find because it's one of the few sitcoms I've actually not rewatched since I was young. And in addition to the, the theme song, absolutely slapping. I, if, you've, if you don't want to rewatch the show, you don't want to pay for Disney+, Plus. that's fine. Just YouTube the Doogie Howser theme song. And if you don't make it your ringtone because it's the best acoustic file you've ever heard i gen we cannot understand each other but uh it's it's a lovely show uh starring neil patrick harris who's a who's a, a young teen who is a child prodigy so in addition to tangling with all the pressures of growing up a teenager in america he uh also has to has the stresses of being a, a medical doctor and it's a lovely time it has aged very well in most respects uh but from a production standpoint it's just stunning they put so much effort and money and love into each one of these episodes that it almost makes you forget there isn't a live studio audience which when i was a kid always confused me i'm like why am i not being cued to know when to laugh by a large group of people laughing i, I don't understand is this a dramedy and i, I suppose it was it's great times doogie Hauser, md watch it I, I i haven't thought about that show in a in a in a very long time i'm gonna highly think... recommend all right all right mine mine is very specific to this time of year, uh, this is one of my favorite times of year. Uh, this is the uh, U.S. Open period of time, right before uh, the week before Labor Day through Labor Day, ending next week. Uh, U.S. Open tennis. Tennis. Oh. Yes. Uh, this year in particular has been really fun uh, on the men's side. There are a lot of uh, American men still in the tournament, which is... Um, not usual ironically for the u.s open the u.s the men men's side has been obviously dominated by like nadal federer Djokovic forever uh for the last like 20 years basically uh, with like a few other players in in there for for good measure this year Djokovic is out alcaraz is out it's kind of a free-for-all who might win which makes it really interesting and there are three American men. There were four yesterday, but uh, one of them, Tommy Paul, lost. So there are three left. Taylor Fritz, Francis Tiafo, and uh, what's the other guy's name? Oh, no, sorry. Just the two left. My bad. The other the other one was uh, was Nakashima, but he, he also lost on Sunday. So there's two U.S. men left, Taylor Fritz, uh, Francis Tiafo, and I am very much hoping that either one of them wins because I really want an American man to win a U.S. Open title at... Uh, at the U.S. Open this year, uh, as a Canadian, I don't know why I'm so like patriotic. I was gonna say like you're 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 so patriotic for the wrong country. No, it's not. It's not. It's just like I <laughs> love this. It's just a. It's a very. I love Wimbledon for it's like yeah. unique Britishness. But there's yeah, something yeah, yeah. about the U.S. Open in like the muggy Bronx, you know, end of <laughs> sure. end of summer kind of vibes. Uh, it's just a lot less formal. It's a lot more fun. I just think it's it's one of my favorite things to watch every year. So if you're not watching it, I I highly recommend you look. Actually, I had no idea that that's happening. Like it's happening pretty close apartment. to you. Yeah, I had no idea. So yeah. thank you. 
Also, just before we wrap, shout out to our friend David Kogan, uh, who launched uh, his his brand new coffee shop this week, Coffee Check in Greenpoint. If you're listening to this show, you almost certainly know it exists because the overlapping uh, audience is, is pretty high. But uh, if you're in the New Brooklyn area or New York in general, just go check it out. Uh, As someone who's been there uh, most of the past seven days, at least once a day, it is uh, it is great. And I would say that even if he didn't own the place, it's, it's, it's really wonderful. I'm really excited to go when I'm in New York next. Uh, and also a special shout out to Jules, who's uh, on the on the boards, rather, um, directing us live. This is the first time we've done, uh, we've changed our production today uh, for the first time. And uh, Jules is here to navigate us all the way from Berlin. Uh, so thanks for sticking with us, Jules. Wow. We, uh, we appreciate you. All right, that's the show. Send us feedback, podcast at endorpolice.com. We love hearing from you. Michael, thank you so much for joining us. Will, thank you, thank yeah. you as Gentlemen. always. I'm, I'm looking forward to both of your respective reviews when they come out. And uh, we'll talk a bit more about The Fold and other tech news next week. Until then, thanks for listening. iPhone, iPhone next week. Oh, that's right. We have Joe Maring of Digital yeah. Trends joining us next week. Let's talk iPhone. I completely forgot. Yeah. It's already September You 3rd. thought you were done, Michael, huh? Thank you, thought you for you were the just... reminder that I'm going to hop on a plane <laughs> in a few days. I avoided IFA, but, um, but yeah, got to go to Cupertino. Well, there are worse places to go. Actually, there aren't that. I mean, <laughs> the Apple campus aside, like right. Silicon Valley is, is just a hellhole yeah. that I, I, we could talk about for a long, a long time. Anyway, thanks for listening. We'll talk to you very soon. Bye-bye. Uh, Michael, I have great news for